Welcome to Belmont Poetry Night. I'm Monica Corday, your host and the Poet Laureate of Belmont, California. We meet on the third Tuesdays of every month to celebrate the spoken word as makers, listeners, and admirers of poetry. We come with featured guests sometimes and an open mic always. Although we may still not be at our favorite physical venue, the Belmont Library, since the pandemic, our thriving poetry circle has transitioned to this virtual space, and I'm grateful this allows me to welcome poets and listeners from across the globe. Uh, as usual, it would be wonderful to know where you are joining me from. So please share in the chat, and thanks for joining me and zooming in. As we go ahead, in the spirit of the Native American Heritage Month observed through this month of November, I bring this evening of poetry to you in the theme, Gift of Our Ancestors. As we move forward, carry our ancestors within us and find gratefulness for the many gifts we have received, I invite you in honoring and acknowledging the land we live on. Let us acknowledge that Belmont is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramayatish Ohlone people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. Let us acknowledge the indigenous communities who have lived in and moved through generations uh, over this land. Indigenous peoples from many nations make their home in this region today. Let us acknowledge recognize and honor their ancestors, descendants, elders, and their communities. Let us give thanks and acknowledge all the original keepers of these lands. Thank you. As we all remember and celebrate the native voices and values, here's a poem by one of my favorite poets, Joy Harjo. Remember, remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the star stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Thank you. Joy Harjo is an American poet, musician, playwright, and author. She is also the first Native American who held the honor of U.S. Poet Laureate, and she is a member of the Muscogee Nation. There is so much Harjo takes us through in all of her poems, uh, in this one especially where remembering is a silent act. And I love how Harjo brings us into conversation with the natural world and uh, cultivates a mindfulness about oneness, honors everything we come from and that which comes from us, uh, which in this case is art, poetry, 
and talking about art. Tonight, we have with us a maker whose work encapsulates multiple artistic traditions from the indigenous culture of the past and the present, a poet who has always had me starstruck, no matter how many times I see her in person also. And uh, she needs no introduction, but for someone as prolific as her, you've got to keep up with all that she's been working on. So here goes. Kim Shuck is the seventh poet laureate of San Francisco, Emerita. She has nine solo books in publication, one co-authored book, and another nine that she edited, co-edited, or participated in editing. Lately, she's been wedging poems into places that poems usually aren't found and causing good trouble wherever possible. Her latest book is a collection of essays called Noodle Rant Tangent from Andover Street Archives Press. Please join me in welcoming my featured artist and poet for this month, Kim Shuck. Kim, uh, it is an immense honor to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm often starstruck by you, actually. The amount of work that you get done is pretty epic, and I, I'm delighted to be here. I was looking over what I sent you, and I realized the last time <laughs> I read for a Belmont poetry event um, featured specifically right. at, at the library event, um was for yeah it was a really long time back it was and unfortunately I started with the same couple of poems that I sent you as my beginning so I'm going to switch things up and completely disobey my instructions <laughs> sure because I we haven't love that you this but um I want to kind of say a thing about why why I'm going to start the way I am so I'm going to say it in a poem this is a response to a question that a student asked me when I read in a class in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I love the every direction power word spit cold into the face of this always storm, but I can't afford the cry song, the next cry song, something that curled up around the dust he kicked when he evoked us and then decided we were gone. I'm not gone. The young man asked me if the rock I carry in my heart, the one handed over with a lineage back to initial invasion, the one with a chain attached that threads through continued occupation, the one that's hooked to every disappeared relative, every murdered bone of every uninvestigated someone's child. Does your rock get too heavy, auntie? Yes, it gets too heavy. Just now when someone who should be an ally declares us gone in eloquent and delicious words, and I think for a second maybe we are, but I catch myself. My aging and practice balance asserts, and I remember, nephew, the rock gets heavy, and to carry it I have to cut other things away so that you don't have to shoulder my share. I'm gonna start with a few pieces out of my murdered missing book. Um, I promise I won't leave you here, but when we're acknowledging uh, lineages, things handed on from our ancestors, it's important to remember that there are a lot of Native women who do not get to be ancestors. And that problem has not ended just because the pandemic has asserted itself as a more exigent problem. Day one, somewhere. She's afraid right now. It hurts to be strangled. The body panics. She's silenced, might die of stroke, pulmonary edema, arteries may tear. Her head feels as if it might explode. And this can take up to five minutes. Day two, blamed for her own death, bled out in a motel bathtub. In court, the defendant's attorney made her as inhuman as possible displayed body parts, her lifestyle, her identity at fault, as if the murder were a logical conclusion, as if her attacker had no choice, as if we were provocation in skin, another acceptable sacrifice. Day three, 
shot, dead named, misgendered. Even the way they looked for you was a violence, each detail a complex inaccuracy targeted as acceptable loss. You're loved in your own name now. We see you. Day four, communities mended over and over. Light story touches the ones literally missing. Patched gatherings, families, stiff with protective stitching are lost are not just gone once, but every waking morning, every song without their voices, each time, every time, for all time. Day five, you are our leading cause of death. Vanished, I can feel myself going transparent. The car her daughter was last seen in was found in the lake, her child's dead body inside. Who has jurisdiction? Local police, reservation police, FBI. We don't know if there was a crime. We don't know if there was a white person involved. In the city, when she didn't come home, I called the police and it was three days before they came to the house. Her disappearance was a choice, should not be hitchhiking. To afford a car, we need to work. No work in town, no public transit. Last seen standing by Highway 16 in the rain. I think that's probably plenty of that. And I know it's not fun, but um, sometimes in the mornings I get a body count sent to me by a friend. And, uh, it's not fun for me either. Moving right into something else. Exile's heart. For how many generations will the exile's heart be passed gene to gene? The story of berries by the river and near words mumbled by a wind through the rocks on a hill. Even when the hand that remembered a rock that fit a child's palm in just such a way, a rock she wished on or the climbing tree and these new holidays, these new ways don't hold water when the wind is from the north and that precise rain starts falling. looking through the poems I sent Monica and realizing I was in the mood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Kim, for, for opening with that uh, really important piece. And I, I wouldn't just say that it is powerful, but it is also uh, that piece really makes you uncomfortable. And I think that's what po good poetry or important poetry always, always does. It, it makes you uncomfortable and, and lets you question things and, and also uh, not ignore uh, what is, what lies in front of you. So thank you so much for, for sharing that and bringing that and uh, just uh, hitting us hard with that, with that opening. And, and, uh, that's what uh, leads me to to my initial question is that in in native cultures orators have been uh, at the very core of indigenous cultures with handed down stories and folk tales uh, and poetry in all its oratory forms uh, songs prayers ceremonial chants uh, that explain and preserve the tribe's history culture uh, its beliefs and a sense of identity uh, so much of your work reflects this this uh, as well, but aside from the traditions of poetic orality and inviting the readers into experiencing indigenous culture, I admire how your poetry also engages with a wide range of topics. And uh, um, as, as a dynamic and multifaceted poet that you are, uh, you have been connecting traditional and contemporary native poetry. So in terms of its evolution and craft, uh, how would you define indigenous poetry today? Ooh, so how would I define indigenous poetry? Hmm. Not sure. I, I also think, uh, I, I'll just throw out there that when, um, at one time I was reading in Britain in a, in a university classroom in Exeter actually, and one of the students said something that knocked me sideways, which was, we can really see the beat poet in, in your voice. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I rarely get accused of that. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because I think quite frequently 
people bring to anyone's poetry what they have on board already. It's like reading tarot cards to fill in the blanks mm -hmm. in the in the sort of um, universal imagery and, and moments that we offer. And unless I'm being didactic, like I was being in those first couple mm -hmm. of poems, people will bring to it what they have and they'll find what they bring. So, you know, you want to write with a light enough hand to where people can fill their own experience into the gap. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure that contemporary indigenous poetry can be defined um, because the United States has a number of how many tribal entities, how many cultures there are, but in fact, we know that they purged a lot of them at various points from their lists. And I'm going to say my count is more like roughly 3,000 different cultures, and a lot of them in California. Um, my work is as much a product of living in Ramatush territory in Yalamu as it is um, having studied and, and knowing um, Cherokee traditions. But it is also as much from the Tatra Mountains, which is where my mother's folks are from, um, the Alpine Carpathians, um, as anything else. And I, I'm, I'm not sure I can tease out the different bits. Um, one from the other, mm -hmm. um, but I, but I do get to read with a lot of indigenous poets. So there is a certain amount of um, what makes um, the poets work indigenous for me is bringing forward those stories and traditions and cultural mores mm -hmm. um, in ways that reflect our lives now. So I'm going to use a different example. I, I, my dance shoes, my traditional dance shoes have cars beaded onto them. And somebody asked me one time why I didn't do more work with uh, more natural images like, like deer. And there aren't a whole lot of deer wandering down Market Street in San Francisco. So you've got to be, really be present for the life that you're living as well as the, um, the value systems and, and the the sort of symbolic um, uh, structures that you're offered from your culture. So um, I would say it's easier for me to say that Cherokee poetry at the moment uh, is reclaiming its voice. So a lot of a lot of um, really powerful and southeastern to loop in Joy Harjo. Her tribe and mine were neighbors at uh, Contact and our neighbors still both in um, the East and in Oklahoma. That Southeastern poetry um, acknowledges the values of uh, um, all of the beings in the place that we're at. And that's a really complex thing that I just said, which going into it very metaphysical, but to acknowledge all of the beings where you are and and to to know where that is and really occupy it. So that's what I think. Oh, absolutely, Kim. Uh, all, all the things that you said, it, it just uh, get gives us insight into, further insight into your poetry, which is such a fine balance, I think, uh, that places your poetry simultaneously looking forward and, and backward and it, it preserves while it also is an evolving idea of, of the Native American culture. So uh, uh, I'm really uh, glad to, to hear uh, all the things that you said, which were putting us right in the moment and in, in the context of where we are. Uh, but would love to hear more before I go into the next questions. Okay. So I write a lot uh, on road trips, and this was one. We were going to Spokane, so I called it the Spokane series. Because, because the lake is steaming, we watch the lake. 
blooms of raspberry algae in the road. The road isn't steaming. It's just pulling Oregon and California together with the one smooth stitch of it. Pulling hard. And there are other stitches, other roads. This one passes the lake, the Paisley Caves, where Creek Clove has built fire, left prints, and someone ate camels, now extinct. Because the lake steams, we stare at the vapor and the unlikely algae, and we sew the states together. We sew them with stitches of car and thought and sometimes with images of caves and herds of camels and fire. We will watch that smoke too. We will let the ideas carry us. Renamed. Lacework barns and railroad ties tossed on the incline. This river cuddled into these hills, this canyon they called hell and named the mountains devils looking on. But older stories in stone hunt bighorn sheep, hunt deer, the river is full of fish and digs. The river digs down into a history of volcano building from the water. Watch the rocks, fantasies of pleated rocks and wildflowers that could cure, or maybe the river's the healer, the scientist. The river digs history and drinks the rocks they renamed for demons. Urgent. Rhythm of hawks being branches, being light posts in the breathing age of a hip shot house next to the river. We know that these rivers are storytellers. They reach way back, reach, reach past rock hound stores and Basque sausage sandwiches, taste living granite thoughts with their broad flat tongues. The clench of banks against the constant birth of these rivers. In the rain, the pant of the story of the valley, stone and dust and temporary hawks pretending with their soft, urgent bodies, their bodies that need the mice to believe in tree branches, leaning into river water, gray with geological thoughts. Four, nesting. We crossed the Sacramento at Red Bluff in the dark, the streetlights breathing back from that water and caramel shivers. If mystery spots could rest end to end, if there were roads marked in dandelion fluff thinking in the crisp eye shine of things not slipped from ancient moorings, things sliding through the humid night to find a place for sleep. Five, fire flying. We crossed the 45th parallel white tail and birch bark fly fire flying flick and flick through the pine trunks through the weeds and past in different fences. So much better when the deer goes slow at a walk and we see them walking all the way into town in gardens eating someone's roses. They diva across the road, lips still smeared and flecked with two pink petals, thick with the rain that's still falling, the rain that will fall for 30 more miles leaning north with no street lights, not one until the town and another lick of the small flashes, small leading like will-o'-the-wisps to drown us in electric lights, to let us sink into a town where we eat the petals. We eat them in the rain, leaning north. This nest piece is kind of a, an essay. I have to open my word file enough to where I can see all of it. There we go. Uh, it's kind of a hybrid thing, and it was published in Transmotion Journal, which is out of the University of Kent, Canterbury. From above, the ponds and creeks and rivers have gone feral and hold hands. I always forget how humid Oklahoma is, how in the heat, the Tulsa airport is the tropics with wild aggressive plant smell. I've come because of family, home and rain. They're not on the face of uncomplicated ideas. Still, two of the three have become major features in constructing identity for Native Americans, American Indians, First Nations people, whatever we are this week. As for the rain, Oklahoma had been awash for weeks. On the ground, waiting for my luggage, there was no evidence of the reported flood. The sunlight was loud and hot, not a cloud to the western horizon. Route 66 was the river we all lived with, knowing its habits and fauna, the sacred diners, the cafes on its shores, and the seasonal overflow. overflow. The map that came with the rental car was a cartoon similar to those given out at amusement parks. Still, it's not that difficult to find north in Oklahoma, up through the port of Catoosa, past the whale, the area around Tulsa unfolds along 66, 
And although there's a turnpike that will spit you out if finally in Veneta, my heart belongs to the long way through. I lost it there as a child and haven't bothered to collect it back. Grandpa had a bronze American Leviathan, the whorehound drops, jerky moccasins, gas, and incandescent constellations of towns at night, telling their very own stories. My family's an assembly of shared stories, linguistic, chemical, and behavioral. I could have never been to Oklahoma and still wanted to call it home because my father called it home. As a child, I made myself a mental necklace with more than a few meanings for this word, the way I had to tug upwards on grandma's doorknob to make the key turn, fishing, locusts, the hills of San Francisco, bay water and creek water and lake water. Our stories, our definitions are not tidy things unless we sacrifice some of ourselves to the imagined order. Anyway, that's part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Kim. Do you okay, do cool. you want to take a question before you proceed? We can. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, go back to the the final lines of of the essay poem that you that you shared right now. I really uh, feel that it's so impactful and it stayed long with me. Uh, our stories, our definitions, are not tidy things unless we sacrifice some of ourselves to the imagined order. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the takeaway for, for me from, from these poems you have offered. And even the Spokane series, uh, I remember uh, you, you had mentioned somewhere uh, that uh, you often uh, write short, uh, short poems a lot more than, than the longer ones, but I'm really uh, glad that you also acquainted us with uh, in the beginning with the Murdered Missing and the Spoken series, which are longer ones and and also sort of traveling poems. So uh, are you writing them while, while you are moving around or, or do they happen after the travels? Mostly while we're going. If you follow on the um, my Facebook writer page, um, mm -hmm. you'll see this last trip we took September, October, Right. Um, there was a poem every day, and I wrote those um, in the moment while we were moving from place to place. Right. Right. Yeah. They they really take us on a journey uh, along along with you. And um, my question is uh, uh, coming to um, uh, being on the other side, where um, we often find ourselves in a time when we see more people are standing up in support and to promote the arts and culture of so many marginal, marginalized communities, uh, immigrant voices, but still we see that we are losing diversity in so many spaces, mm -hmm. whether it's biodiversity or linguistic diversity or cultural diversity. Uh, and you have mentioned this to me uh, during our one of our talks. And I've also heard you say in, in other interviews that the work that you do as an artist and the poetry you write is not just directed to see the indigenous cultures of the Western hemisphere surviving, but it is also directed to seeing that all cultures survive and, and keep moving forward. And it, it of course uh, reflects in your expansive work and role as the San Francisco Poet Laureate uh, Emerita, as community activist, uh, as an artist and, and as, as an educator. So uh, if you can share uh, some of the poetry projects or initiatives that you have organized that have also helped in bringing more non-native communities to the foreground, uh, that would be great. I love that you frame it that way because um, mm -hmm. there have been a few projects that I've done where people have contacted me and said, you know, mm -hmm. you. The, the, I'm trying not to say this, but there really wasn't anybody else. A couple of people contacted me while I was doing a state poem of the day with the San Francisco Public Library, right. which was something that um, was intended to reach out to people as they had to go into lockdown for the COVID pandemic. So for a year, I posted a poem every day, mostly by different people, unless I wrote a memorial poem for somebody we'd either uh, asked to get a poem from, or most of the time it was somebody who had already had a poem posted. We lost a lot of the people in the pandemic who were part of that project, but somebody decided that um, 
that I wasn't including enough. In fact, they said, you're not including any straight white men in your work. And since I hadn't really thought about it that way, I thought, well, let's check. Except I'm pretty sure that Jack Hirschman is straight and white and he had been included. So I went through and I looked and I was like, there's actually slightly, depending on how you break it down, because that's always tricky, right? So um, I went, okay, uh, straight and white is a category and male is a category. So straight white men, straight white women, gay white men, gay white women. And I broke it down. And if you break it down that way, actually straight white men were slightly better represented than anybody else, which sort of ticked me off because <laughs> I, I was like, ooh, I have to be careful because I did want it to be kind of balanced. And so I went through and depending on how you counted it, I sort of worked it around going, you know, the way I'm thinking about what I actually ended up with was more um, Asian women as a general category, um, which makes sense on this coast and this time at, in this place and with who I read. But um, so I'm, I don't know, I, it, it's, it's hard. I understand why some people can't pull this off. You know what I mean? And sometimes I don't pull it off either. But um, if what you want to hear is what you want to hear, it's sometimes easy to overlook groups of people. And since my goal was to not do that, I had to decide that there were poems I had to support that weren't about or for me, and maybe I didn't even like them. But that's not the point. The point is that if you are a person who has been designated as someone who is um, forwarding poetry generally, it doesn't all get to be about you, right? So there are a lot of people who take these roles on it. And um, I mean, we know who they are and you know that neither one of us are them, but there are people who take these roles on and then use them to just forward their own work, which for me wasn't the point. And, uh, you know, you gotta really do it. So I, I'm doing a series of books right now. And the first one is I have a, um, what is it? This is the proof one that should be out any second. It's called uh, This Wandering State. And this one's San Francisco. And I started with San Francisco because uh, people here know and love me and will forgive me for all of the mistakes that the first one is inevitably going to have. And the second one is uh, Fresno, Madeira and Mariposa counties. And we'll be working our way around to Belmont. I'll be giving you a call because um, I can obviously not do this, but our, our premise was we were going to include people who had no fixed address, people who had been imprisoned, um, people of all different ages, uh, folks of varying um, backgrounds. And, <clears throat> and uh, my one really important thing was to include the work of um, people indigenous to that place. And I already failed because no amount of testering, Jonathan Cordero or Greg Castro managed to kick up um, a Ramatush poet. And I was like, Greg, doodle in a corner. Let me add that to the book, anything, anything at all. <laughs> But no, but I'm really well covered for uh, Chickchansey people who are Fresno area. And, uh, and there are some incredible poets uh, from the Chickchansey who I'm including in the second book. So, you know, we're working on it. And the, the trick is really, um, it doesn't have to be for you. Maybe it's for somebody else. And that that's the job you take on when you represent an art form as opposed to my own work, which is for me, you know. Absolutely, more, more power to all the work that you're doing and to you, Kim. And it's, it's really incredible, uh, the, the, the vastness and, and the magnitude of the things that you, that you take on. Uh, and, and like Harjo 
uh, said, uh, there is no separation. We are all from the same place. And as long, there is, as, as, long as there is respect and acknowledgement of connections, mm -hmm. things continue working. And when all that stops, we all die. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so, okay. So uh, I take a slightly different line from Joy, although it's in the mm -hmm. same direction, which is that um, we are on, at at base the same mm -hmm. but we are informed by the things around us by where we live by the circumstances that we're in and so if those are if, if you are a plant that is not getting what it requires then you are going to grow in a different way from a plant that's getting what it requires and so we become different but at base at origin point there's a way in which we're not different and here's where culture and language comes in too because uh, part of my position on language is we need all the languages. They, we need to, to support them. Uh, the word preserve always makes me think of jam and mm -hmm. not so much. Um, and that's because each language represents an um, codification of an environment, a biome, uh, a, a worldview and um, in the same way that planting monoculture in a field is a bad idea, monoculture in a community is equally a bad idea. We need different solutions to a problem. And it's not that you have to seek to create um, variation in culture in a place. You just need to recognize that it exists already and make space for all of those voices. And that's key. So, for example, in my open mic <clears throat> on uh, the second and fourth Mondays of every month, we do an open mic where we go through and we are there until everybody in the open mic has read one poem. I'm not picking and choosing. I'm not preferentially getting people who get to me first. There are people who I could really some weeks do without hearing that poem and I know it before it starts, but I am not going to exclude them because again, that poet is speaking to someone mm -hmm. and that voice needs to be heard too. You know, so. yeah. And I, I know that you kind of asked me for a list. So I'm involved in about 10 different projects right now that are not solo projects. So um, there's a women's project at Pololi mm -hmm. that I'm doing mostly in collaboration with Eileen Castaneto. There's, um, there are more of these books. There's a project I'm doing with the Clarion Alley Mural Project folks, Megan um, Wilson in particular called uh, Manifest Differently, where we're taking on, um, a, we've got a group of artists and poets who are taking on the issue of manifest destiny and how it affected them personally. You know, take it personally, write about it personally. What does that mean? Um, so I've got a lot, a lot of projects still working on the San Francisco poetry map, which is not going up until I get poets from every single area. And I'm really committed to that. Because when I asked for submissions, I got a lot of them for from um, North Beach. I got a lot of them from the Mission. I got a few from Noe Valley. I got a few from the Castro. I got like one from the Richmond District. Still don't have any from a lot of places around the city. And and I'm happy to. We're we're. It's basically a map online. You can mouse over it and pull up poems. There's some great poems on it, but it's not going up online until I've got poets from every area. That's perfect. No, it's a rem remarkable. Uh, all the projects that you are uh, working on, Kim, and not uh, not as much as uh, for a list of things, but I think it's really important for for all of us uh, here and everyone to to hear about the the work that goes into each of these projects and. Uh, like I said, the scale of it as well, uh, and in the different ways you are approaching the different communities that exist. So I think it's really important uh, that you you talk about it and we we know about it, uh, not just from an online resource, but but it's wonderful to hear that from yourself. So thanks for sharing that. And uh, if you'd like to take us to through a couple more poems, uh, and then maybe we can look at some of your art pieces as well. 
Okay. You have you have images of the art pieces, right? Or are we I'm sorry. To, you have images of the art pieces. We yes. Look? Okay. Yes, I do. I I would be I sharing that. Well, but with panic there. I was like, <laughs> no, no. You can you can relax, Kim. All all you do is just relax and and offer the poems. Okay. Um, how many times have we woven, rewoven the cocoon, made ourselves different? split the careful construction, come loose, shaken free, transformed by our own art. How many times will we find the light instructions, recipes for a word for survival that we've never shaped before? We will wear the agates, their inscriptions cracked from wildfire, from prayer fire. And who are we to decide where the altars are placed? We'll walk into the next moment, shivering the sacred water, which we know is all water. We'll wash the dead, shake ourselves, start weaving again, call words into the chosen stairwell, because we are the people of stairwells, of mass transit, of the echoes underground. We are the characters of myth, and even in the deep weaving, never doubt it. There's an empty part that echoes cold, echoes cold. I wrap garlands of your words twined with prayers we both learned early, a hand clasp, a belonging, the habit of pulling the stuff of self into words, a habit of words like sacred herbs, words that taste like apricots, apples, salt, songs from those other mountains, one I find myself singing this morning. Today, I may bake the bread of childhood, light the candles of my grandmother's. Today and in other times, I will wear the red thread of your words at my wrist. And that was for Jack Hirschman. That was my memorial poem for him. <clears throat> it's the small hauntings that are most effective, the door that will not open and then will not stay closed. The messages from the dead, the sky is rain, the sky is rain, but will not rain. I caught the cat's purr in a locket just this morning. I caught it. We pool. Like bears and people, like bears and people linked by water, we count the water, count the morning coyotes, the first dawn coyotes rummaging bushes for stray pets. There are danger in the park, and the dark is getting long here at the end of August, the start of September. This time of year has long ears, and we pull in the thumb spaces, the visions of others. This year and a half, we know our spaces so well. We teach about speaking to the corners, teach so that the sound of coyotes hunting will be known and we pool in the home canyons like bears and people and we wait. The raven is on the porch again, aligning her stunning, aiming her editorial eye, adjusting her feathers. One soft edged breast plume curls around smoke filled air and settles on the welcome mat. Fire season, fire season, she says in her softer voice. Fire season, and the charbird has come. It was beautiful, Kim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, coming to your art making that, uh, that goes beyond the page, uh, from words to beads into assemblies of things, uh, working with the traditional indigenous crafts of weaving and beadwork, uh, there is a metamorphosis that we see from uh, a thought and an emotion to a tangible, stunning visual experience. And that visual, visual experience also exists in, in these poems that you uh, are offering. Um, and you've mentioned that uh, Carol Lee Sanchez uh, as your poetry hero or mentor, uh, yeah. who has who has been your art hero and teacher? And while you while you share that, I will go ahead and share uh, the images as well. Well, my first art teacher was Ruth Asawa. Um, so I know I'm lucky. <laughs> I had a really good teacher. Um, I also had. Uh, the kind of teaching you get at home. So uh, my grandmother, my Polish grandmother, uh, weaving is also um, a Polish art form. Uh, my grandfather used to talk to my mother about how he remembered the uh, sound of the floor loom 
um, which he never told me, but, and mom always sort of thought that I had gotten into weaving because of him, but I never heard that story. So it, it, there's something in there that's, that's definitely resonant. My degree, my MFA is in textiles. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a bit of a Luddite. And when I say that, I mean also that I hand weave things and hand bead things. So that's all mm -hmm. the way to the ground. Um, who else are my heroes? I've got mm -hmm. a, uh, one of the projects that I've got going right now is um, back Thursday, we're, we're, I'm going to the museum to work on it. It's a mm -hmm. show of beadwork that's going into the Marin Museum of the American Indian. And there are a couple of my heroes in that one. Um, Martha Berry, who brought back, um, it's terrible. We kind of go around about whether she brought back uh, Cherokee beadwork. I'm, I'm not convinced about that, but she certainly brought back the concept of a Cherokee accent, if you will, in beading. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn Pallet, who is going to surpass us all. Um, and uh, Valerie Kagan, who when I wanted a piece made to commemorate my, my daughter who passed about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I asked her, I'm not without my own skill. And I just need to say that I, um, I asked somebody else to do that piece and it was Valerie Kagan. So I need you to take that one seriously. All three of those women are incredible. And then there's some of my work in it as well. It's gonna be an incredible show. Uh, so those people are definitely my art heroes. Who else? Um, well, I've named somebody from Black Mountain and I've named some traditional people. So maybe that's what I need. <laughs> And, and uh, back when you mentioned, uh, Kim, that uh, um, one of the artists who uh, does the beadwork, it's uh, the Cherokee accent. Uh, it, right. it, uh, so uh, could, you, could you say something in Cherokee so we can hear that, hear that and just get, a, get a, an idea of what you're talking about? Okay, I'll teach you the words you're most likely to hear, okay? So, uh -huh. <laughs> osio is hello. Osio. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Kim Shakta Guado, which means my name is Kim Shak. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, people say it sounds a bit like Japanese. It's definitely a syllabic language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I was I got interested in that as soon as soon as you mentioned it because uh, during my research for for this topic I came across uh, uh, the word uh, the origin of the word or uh, the Cherokee uh, also means people of different speech. So one of uh, one of one another of them, word right. that there's another word for it in Cherokee which means to measure. To measure, I see. So you you will hear. <clears throat> people who are smarter than me of tribes that are not mine say that there is no word in any native language for art and I have to say mm -hmm. that I don't think you can ever make a statement that's that broad about our cultures taken as an aggregate because there are mm -hmm. definitely words both for art and for poetry in Cherokee mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a bit of mythology what it is though what is true is that uh, the concept of artist is not separate from the concept of um, just everybody. Mm. You know, mm. it, we don't separate. We don't necessarily set those people above other. You know what I mean? There's this differentiation in um, Western culture between people who make and mm. Mm. you know, it's we don't we don't play that way, but. Yeah, yeah. You have well, uh, if uh, if you can uh, take us through some of these art pieces, well, uh, Kim, uh, yeah. it would be really lovely. So the sandpiper that you see, I was doing a series for an online project with a historian and a web designer. Mm -hmm. I think it's called Crossing Waterways, and it's a poetic tour of uh, the daylit. Um, watershed in the Presidio 
right leads to El Paluna Spring. And I did a whole bunch of pieces that were um, either endangered or indigenous creatures to that area. The pic that picture of the sandpiper is actually under black light. Those glowing beads are actually glowing. Um, if you see it under normal light, those beads just look clear. Wow. Beautiful. Um, I was trying to show something about energy moving in the animals. Mm -hmm. And on the Presidio uh, web page, I, I also noticed, um, uh, do you also pair uh, it with a poem? Yeah. Uh, with, a, with a piece that you write specifically for the artwork? I do. I do. Yeah, <laughs> that is really amazing. So it's it's a, it is a multi-dimensional uh, insight into into your work and and please uh, tell us about the warrior trout as well, which is, which is there on yeah. the flyer also. That one got different names as time went on. It's sort of fun. It's a cutthroat trout, um, and I think there are fifty different colors in that piece. Yeah, it's so intricate and, and beautifully done. And not it's not as clear in the photo as it is in person how many different colors there are, because I'm counting different colors as uh, different surface treatments as well. So some of them are matte and some of them are shiny. And so anyway, so there's a lot of variation. And um, so uh, when you engage with your art, which is uh, which is the beadwork or weavings, uh, is it is it also a in any way a spiritual experience for you or um, does it connect you to uh, memories when you're working on the piece? Uh, is there some, what is the intention behind it when you're working on, on a, a something like this? Some of my work, uh, how, how mystical do I want this to sound? <laughs> So I don't think any artist approaches any piece of art without knowing what we do is, is um, I'll go for the word healing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all know that that's what we're doing. Um, either by tearing something down or by building something up, I tend to go for the yeah. building of something up. This particular piece, Well, you picked one I was showing off is what I was doing. I'll be real honest. But part of it <laughs> is that the, this particular animal, I did this right after there'd been a huge uh, chemical spill in a place where they spawn. And mm -hmm. um, I was also trying to, try, it's kind of a prayer for the fish. Mm -hmm. And, and there is this uh, constant imagery in, in poems as well, where the river comes in a lot, the rain is there, the fishes are there. So, yeah. so it's, it's very evident in, in your poetry and, and your work in general, uh, all the plants and animals or, or fishes that you talk about. I, uh, at one point I was studying Chinese medical theory and my teacher who's um, a Chinese medical practitioner of some note, um, read a couple of my pieces, looked at some of my work and said, I'm not surprised about this at all because you have so much water in your, um, yeah. your horoscope chart. Like, okay, I, I accept that. I also accept comments that, I mean, there are people in the audience today who know my pop. Dad was in the Navy. Uh, I live in San Francisco where we're right in the middle and I, you know, we're surrounded by water on three sides. There are all kinds of theories about it. Um, it's probably true that uh, my family in Oklahoma would not have survived on uh, everybody's income if they couldn't have fished mm -hmm. and supplemented their food by that. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons where water might crop up in things. But um, when I started, I started doing this project and somebody said, I'm not sure you're ever going to be able to make uh, a fish where people could distinguish between one fish and another and I'm like well let's let's see and I think a lot of people know that that's a trout all right so now we're looking yep. at the boots were made for my niece 
um, and they are a quote, she is uh, also a Southeastern woman. And they're a quote, we do a thing called stomp dance. You probably have never seen it. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's uh, one of the things that happens with that is we strap shell shakers around our ankles and we dance with them. That's the, the sound is the deal there. So that's what that is. Also in that piece, there are words um, in uh, her language hidden in the beadwork. So I beat a word and then I beat around it. It's not immediately obvious. So a lot of my beadwork has uh, changes under black light, changes if you look really carefully, changes if the temperature changes, because mm -hmm. I use, uh, I will use heat reactive beads as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that's those. They're frequently visible. Today is Rock Your Mox Day, by the way. Uh, if you don't know oh. what that is, like you'll see once a year, you'll see a lot of native people posting pictures of their feet, either on Facebook or on Instagram or both, and uh, wearing traditional shoes. And so um, these kind of crop up every year about this time. I get to see them again on my feed. And if you look at <laughs> my feed today, I posted a couple of I did. I did see a different pair of of them, them on I your feed. Are, I think I posted like three different pairs because I, <laughs> I make shoes for a lot of people. The basket yeah. is uh, now that basket is about that big. It's a, a traditional style basket, but I did it small again because I was showing off. <laughs> um, well, it, it is still absolutely exquisite, uh, Kim. All, all the work here and so ash. detailed and, and precise. That material is hand pounded white ash. So, oh, wow. Um, and then you also work with the threads. I see the thread work is also there in the weaving. Yeah, that's waxed linen. So that's a different thing. I really did get a master's degree in basket weaving. I know that's a joke in a lot of places. <laughs> Then uh, the, um, the image of the, the different stick critters, that mm -hmm. is not traditional. I don't know where that came from. I think um, <laughs> I was, I think it, if I'm not mistaken, I was thinking about making dolls, which is a whole other story and it's way too long, but. Um, they are finger puppets, right? Are, are they? No, they're not finger puppets. No, they're, they're not? <laughs> they're heads on sticks. <laughs> and they sort of stand well, on the, all, yeah. all of us are really loving loving them thank oh. you <laughs> um you know and they that i think i don't think it was that picture but those pieces ended up on the cover of the canadian um poets uh book right the nor kishik's book and um you know it's which was great honor and uh, so that's rabbit and wolf and um, sunflower and that's gator down in the corner. But uh, yeah, all of us are heads on sticks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, for, for taking us through for sure. each of yeah. them. And uh, if, you, if you have uh, a one more poem to offer before I close this segment, uh, that'll be fantastic. Probably do, but I need to escape from this. Yep, that uh, I will take care of. I have put my glasses down somewhere. I appreciate that people indulging me in the whole thing. So now I turned off my phone because it was making a noise. Now I have to open something else. Oh, there you are. Ha ha. I have conquered the tech. <laughs> Almost. Um, this was one of the pandemic poems. Take me to rain and let my parched body have deep, wet breaths be dissolved. Today's early light is fixed on my thirsty left eye. I crackle, I spark, I catch fire. 
We bring our old water songs to the edges. We sing them. We are the instruments, our dry, dry thoughts, our dry folded thoughts crack the word for rain. Gorgeous. Now I'm going to read what you guys said because while well, the other things were up, I couldn't see them. So. And thank you, Peter Carroll. <laughs> thank you so much, Kim. Uh, and uh, we will come back to you at the end of the open mic, but your reading and this conversation has been so illuminating. And I feel that uh, native arts and even indigenous poetry is often looked through uh, an anthropological lens, which is important, but I'm grateful for your work, which not only acquaints us to the indigenous cultures, but also reminds us of our interconnectedness as, as a community. So thank you for this voyage you have taken us on, both in your poetry and in your art. And I'll open up the floor briefly for any questions or comments before uh, we close the segment. Uh, and while you do that, I will share some of the links uh, for Kim's poetry books and uh, website and upcoming readings. So please feel free to unmute yourself and talk to Kim. Uh, Kim, real quick, Steve Arnson here. Did you go to the Paisley Caves when you were on that road trip? Just wondering. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was there too. I love the feeling I got just sitting in such a thing, an old place like that. Thank you. No, thank you so much for your readings, this is Phil Harris. I got lucky enough to see you at Filoli uh, with your artist friend when you were he was creating art while you were reading poems, and so that's always very exciting. And I'm I'm always so struck in groups like this how as any reader says something and you see something and you think about something else. And um, one of the things was with your, the first two beadwork pieces of the bird and you said, well, if they're under black light, they glow. Well, I mean, things like hummingbirds and butterflies don't really have any color. They just have refractions of light, which is why of course they can change color. So they're really in effect clear in, in many ways. So, um, and just the whole thing of, you know, retaining language, um, saw something several years ago. I'm not sure which language it was, it was in New England and a woman had a dream and her ancestors were saying, basically you have to save the language and she didn't know where to go. And as she did research, she found a Bible that some early settler had and this person had written interlinear all the, the translations into that language. And so they were able to recreate the language from that. And it's now being taught um, on, you know, Cape Cod and in that area. And so, it, I mean, it's just, it's sort of like that again, where we're all connected, you know, there's this piece that is lost and then somehow somebody who maybe shouldn't be the connection is the connection. And I don't know, I think it's important. Anyway, thank you so much. I love hearing your word. Okay, then thank you all for the questions and comments and uh, Kim, uh, your wisdom and graciousness and your time is a gift to all of us. Thank you for sharing it and it was truly grand uh, to host you tonight. Uh, I hope you too enjoyed being here and uh, uh, I'll call back uh, uh, once again once at the end of the open mic. And uh, yeah, before I close this segment, I also wanted to add that uh, curating and hosting these poetry nights over a year now has been deeply enriching and, and bringing poetry and people together is inspiring uh, in every way to me. So I'm really thankful to all of you for being here, uh, for sharing your time and your words and your art and joining me online uh, from different parts of the Bay and the world. So thanks a lot once again. And uh, please note that uh, December will be a holiday break. So I will be bringing the next poetry night to you in January. And with that, we are going to stop recording this segment. Those of you who are in the Zoom room, uh, please stay online for the open mic segment of the evening. Uh, to you, the YouTube audience, thanks again for joining me. Uh, for this month's virtual Belmont Poetry Night and here's wishing everyone a warm and safe holiday season. Good night.